Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you to the sixth lecture of the course on ADR and arbitration. In first five lectures, I am sure you have understood the basics of arbitration, you are familiar with the definitions and most importantly, you are familiar with section 7 which we discussed in last two sessions, where we understood as to how you, arbitration agreement is uh, a very important aspect of the Arbitration Conciliation Act. We understood that unless you have an arbitration agreement, you cannot go for arbitration. We tried to distinguish an arbitration agreement from any other agreement for expert determination. And if you recall, we also discussed some of the important uh, characteristics of an arbitration agreement, the principles of incorporation by reference. And we also had a discussion on validity of two-tier arbitration agreement. Now, with that background, we can move on to Section 8 of the Act now because last two classes were on Section 7. And towards the end of my last lecture, if you remember, I said that there are two points very clear. One is you cannot have arbitration unless you have an arbitration agreement. And second is if you have an arbitration agreement, then there is no other option. You will have to go to arbitration. What I mean by that, I explained it briefly in the previous session also. If there is an arbitration agreement between you and me, how can you commit breach of this arbitration agreement? The breach of this agreement can be committed when there is a dispute in existence and in place of referring the matter to arbitration, one of us approach a court or any judicial authority. So, Agreement says we will resort to arbitration and when the dispute arose, one of us go to court. In that case, court is obliged to refer the matter back to arbitration. And therefore, what I am saying is, you are not in a position to commit breach of arbitration agreement. Even if you make an attempt, you will be sent back for arbitration. That is the subject which we will take up in this lecture. I welcome you to the sixth lecture and this is on power of court to refer parties to arbitration. As I said, power of court or power of judicial authority, that should be the correct term. Power of judicial authority to refer parties for arbitration, it is there in section 8. We will read initial few sentences of section 8 and then try to understand as to what section 8 provides for. If you see, section 8 is power to refer parties to arbitration where there is an arbitration agreement. A judicial authority, and kindly note that I have highlighted the word judicial authority in bold. A judicial authority before which an action is brought in a matter which is the subject of an arbitration agreement. So what is the story here? There is a judicial authority before which an action is brought Although that matter should have been sent to the arbitration because it relates to a subject which is the subject matter of arbitration agreement. Or any person claiming through or under him. Kindly don't read or any person claiming through or under him right now. We will come back to this point later on. So a judicial authority before which an action is brought in a matter which is the subject of an arbitration agreement shall if a party to the arbitration agreement so applies, not later than the date of submitting his first statement on the substance of the dispute, then, notwithstanding any judgment, decree or order of the Supreme Court or any other court, refer the parties to arbitration. Now, you see, there are few points which you, have, which you don't have to read right now. For example, any person claiming through or under him. Don't read it right now. Notwithstanding any judgment, decree or order of Supreme Court or any court. 
Don't read these two parts and then see what is the meaning of this statement. There is an arbitration agreement, a dispute arises that is covered by arbitration agreement. That means when it is covered by arbitration agreement, ideally the matter should go to arbitration. But what is happening, one of the parties is committing, committing breach of arbitration agreement and taking the matter to a judicial authority, to a court. Now, in this situation, the other party has to raise an objection. And he has to raise an objection not later than the date of submitting his first statement on the substance of the dispute. So, there is a timeline given within which you must raise your objection. You have to raise the objection before submitting your case before that court on merits. And if that happens, the judicial authority before which an action has been brought is obliged to refer the parties to arbitration, full stop. This was the law till 2015. So what all was missing? The red highlighted part was missing, any person claiming through or under him, notwithstanding any judgment, decree or order of the Supreme Court or any other court it was missing, unless it finds that prima facie no valid arbitration agreement exists. These three points were missing. And that is what we have to understand as to how these three parts came, why did these three parts come. So that is what we have to understand in the next 45 minutes. So the story is very clear. There is an arbitration agreement. A dispute arises. That dispute is covered by that arbitration agreement. But instead of referring the matter to arbitration, one of the parties take the case to a judicial authority. If the other party raises an objection before submitting his case on merits, before presenting arguments on substance of the case, if he raises the objection that this court does not have jurisdiction, that this court should refer the matter for arbitration, because the matter which has been raised here is covered by the arbitration agreement, in that case, the judicial authority is obliged, is under a duty to refer the matter for arbitration. When we enacted section 8, we followed Article 8 of Ancitral Model Law. But then there are two differences which we maintain. The first difference is Model Law uses the word court, whereas Indian Act uses the word judicial authority. Now that's a significant difference because judicial authority is much wider than court. Judicial authority includes courts. So therefore, we don't only want to say that if the party goes to court, we are saying that if the party goes to a court, if the party goes to a tribunal, if a party goes to say company law, tribunal, whatever, any adjudicating authority. So therefore, it is a wider provision. Use of word judicial authority makes section 8 wider as compared to article 8 of Ancitral model law. That's a good change. That's a positive difference. Another difference between Indian Section 8 and Ancitral Article 8 was the last part which you see, unless it finds the last part which you can see in Section 8, Subsection 1, unless it finds that prima facie no valid arbitration agreement exists. This was not there till 2015 amendment. What does it mean? It means that till 2015, the judicial authority was under an obligation to immediately refer the matter for arbitration if the matter is covered by an arbitration agreement and if there is an opposition by the other party. The judicial authority did not have to look into the validity of arbitration agreement. That was not the job of judicial authority till 2015. Whereas, ancestral model law since beginning provided that the court before which a case has been brought before referring the matter for arbitration will have to first of all determine whether the agreement which the party is referring to is a valid arbitration agreement or not. You see in article 8 of ancestral model law towards the end of the provision it is written that court will refer the parties for arbitration unless it finds that the agreement is null and void, inoperative and incapable of being performed. 
So, court according to Ancitral Article 8, a court before referring or refusing to refer the matter for arbitration has to first of all see whether the arbitration agreement before referring the matter for arbitration or refusing to refer for arbitration, it is the duty of the court under Article 8 of Ancitral Model Law to first of all examine whether the agreement in question is a valid agreement. Because if it is a null agreement, if it is a void agreement, it is inoperative. If it is incapable of being performed in such a situation, the court will not send the matter for arbitration because if the agreement is invalid, there will never be an arbitration. And in that case, it is a fit case for trial to be done with the court itself. But we did not give this power to the judicial authority under Section 8 when we made our 1996 Act. Why did we deviate from ancestral model? That was a significant question. When we were copying ancestral model law, when we were incorporating ancestral model law, and if you remember, I said we adopted direct adoption method. We were taking one article, reading it, modifying it to suit our conditions, and then reenact it in the form of a relevant provision in Indian Act. So, if you see a change between Indian provision and an ancestral provision, that means that's a deliberate change. That's a deliberate change. We have dropped this part. Means definitely there is some reason for that. And the reason proposed was, the reason suggested was because we do not want to give the power to decide validity of agreement to any authority before it is first of all examined by the arbitral tribunal itself in section 16. Let me tell you something about section 16. Section 16 incorporates a principle called as principle of competence competence. It is internationally recognized principle called principle of competence competence which means arbitral tribunal has the competence to rule on its competence. Arbitral tribunal has the jurisdiction to decide its jurisdiction and that includes power to the arbitral tribunal to decide validity of the arbitration agreement. So it is the arbitral tribunal in section 16 which will decide the validity of arbitration agreement whether the agreement on the basis of which parties have started arbitration is a valid agreement or not. Only then it will decide whether to continue with arbitration or not. Now, Indian logic was, the logic behind Indian provision was that we don't want to give this power to judicial authority in section 8. We do not want to allow judicial authority under section 8 to decide validity because this question will be for the first time decided by the tribunal in section 16. If you allow it to be decided in section 8, that would mean you are curtailing the scope of section 16. You are curtailing the scope of power of arbitral tribunal which we don't want to do. We don't want to do it because we have adopted the principle of judicial minimalism. Section 5 of the Act talks about judicial minimalism. I referred to it in our initial lectures. To the extent it is given in the Act itself, judicial intervention is permitted. No more intervention beyond that. 10 or 12 places where judicial intervention, court intervention is possible in the entire Act. By way of interpretation, we don't want to expand the judicial intervention because a balance has been maintained between party autonomy on one hand and court intervention on the other hand. Any interpretation which enhances judicial intervention will disturb this balance. So therefore, section 8, this power was not given in the year 1996 when we made the law. Why we did not give this power to judicial authority? Because we want to give it to the tribunal for the first time. In section 16, tribunal shall for the first time decide the question. That was the idea. In fact, it was criticized by some of the authors. One author says that it is not a wise idea to first of all ask the judicial authority to refer the matter to tribunal for arbitration without examining validity. Because according to section 8, if a case comes before a court, a judicial authority, it is obliged to refer the matter for arbitration if the opposite party raises an objection. So, the court will refer it for arbitration without looking into the validity of arbitration agreement. And once it goes to tribunal, parties will incur expenditure in creating the tribunal 
and on the very first day tribunal comes to the conclusion that the agreement is invalid so therefore it is not fit for arbitration go for trial so you will be coming back to the court so some authors believe that this would mean wastage of time and resources anyways we maintained this difference for a good number of years from 1996 to to the beginning of this century we maintained the difference between ancestral and indian law and then came the case of hindustan petroleum corporation limited versus pink city midway petroleum hindustan petroleum corporation limited versus pink city midway petroleum as i have said we are not reading the underlined portions right now we'll come back to this provision later on so i said till from 1996 we did not allow judicial authority in section 8 to determine validity of arbitration agreement if an objection has been raised the judicial authority is obliged to refer the matter for arbitration and arbitral tribunal will decide the validity or judicial authority will not then i said this case comes hindustan petroleum corporation limited versus pink city midway petroleum 2003 supreme court in which supreme court held that the judicial authority under section 8 before referring or denying to refer parties for arbitration is entitled to it has to and it is bound to decide the jurisdictional issues raised before it and one of the jurisdictional issues is determination of validity of the agreement what has happened in 2003 let's understand this point in 2003 judgment, Supreme Court says that you cannot say that judicial authority is going to refer the parties for arbitration or refuse parties, disallow them from going to arbitration on the basis of nothing. How can the judicial authority take this action? How can the judicial authority take this decision? Should the judicial authority refer the matter to arbitration without deciding whether the party who is raising an objection is a party to arbitration agreement. Try and understand. One can always say that the party, the person who raised an objection is not a party to arbitration agreement. Should the court still say, no, there is an objection which has come, therefore we are referring you to arbitration? Or should the court examine whether the party who is raising the objection is a party to arbitration agreement or not? Supreme Court says, yes, it should examine whether the party approaching is party to arbitration agreement. Or when a matter is filed before the court, other party or somebody is raising an objection before submitting on merits. But the first party who has filed the matter before the court is saying that the matter is not covered by arbitration agreement. Should the court get into this question? The first party who has filed the case before the court is saying that because the arbitration agreement is not valid. I know it is not valid. Because it was signed by me under coercion. I know. A fraud was committed on me. Therefore, I signed the arbitration agreement. It is invalid. I did not, or I did not have the capacity to enter into this agreement when I signed it. I was a minor. In case an agreement is signed under force, fraud, coercion, undue influence, minority, such an arbitration clause is not a valid arbitration clause. Now, if the party who has filed the case before the court is saying that I have filed the case before the court because I understand the arbitration agreement is invalid. Should the court go into this question to determine whether it is valid or not? Is it saying the correct version or not? Should the court examine the element of coercion which he is referring to? Or should the court only say, no, no, there is an objection which has come. We will not do anything. Now the objection has come. We will refer it to arbitration. That position was clarified by the Supreme Court in 2003. And Supreme Court says that the judicial authority before referring the matter for arbitration or refusing to refer the matter for arbitration has to decide these questions because these are jurisdictional questions. These are jurisdictional questions. 
the correct answer of this jurisdictional question will decide whether the court is right in exercising jurisdiction or not. You get jurisdiction, you assume jurisdiction on the basis of correct determination of jurisdictional questions. For example, if I am allowed, if I have been asked to engage a class provided there are at least 20 students present, I go to the class, I see there are just two students present, I still started taking my class. I assume jurisdiction of taking class on the basis of wrong determination. That's a mistake which I have committed with respect to jurisdictional question. A determination of fact which confers jurisdiction on me was wrongly done. So therefore, in Hindustan Petroleum Corporation case versus Pink City Midway Petroleum, Supreme Court says that this is a jurisdictional question and unless you are sure that there is a valid agreement, there is no reason for the court to refer the parties to arbitration. So from 1996 till 2003, the law was the judicial authority to immediately refer the parties to arbitration without going into these jurisdictional questions, whether the agreement is valid, whether the party approaching is party to the agreement. But in 2003, the law changes and Supreme Court says that Judicial authority under Section 8 has to answer these questions, has to decide validity of arbitration agreement. Now, the effect of this judgment of Pink City Midway Petroleum was that judicial authority deciding this question would mean that now the power of tribunal in Section 16 is curtailed. Tribunal had the power to decide the validity. If the judicial authority, if a court has already decided it, can the tribunal re examine it? Again, no. Will you allow the tribunal to now say that no, it is invalid, you were wrong in deciding the validity? So therefore, once it has been decided in section 8, the same question will not be examined by the tribunal in section 16. So what I am trying to say is, this interpretation of section 8 done by Supreme Court in Pink City Midway Petroleum case has the potential to curtail the scope of section 16 because now there are certain situations, there are cases which pass through section 8. In those cases, the jurisdiction of the tribunal to decide validity of arbitration agreement is curtailed because this question has already been decided by the judicial authority in section 8. I hope it is clear. Now, this law remained there from 2003 till 2015, and in 2015, we amended the law and we introduced the phrase unless it finds that prima facie no valid arbitration agreement exists. Now, if you go back to the previous slide, you can see the bold part which I have highlighted in section 8 subsection 1 unless it finds that prima facie no valid arbitration agreement exists. This was not there. Then Supreme Court said Validity is to be determined. At one point of time, prior to 2003, judicial authority will not decide validity at all. From 2003 to 2015, judicial authority by virtue of that Supreme Court decision was deciding the validity of agreement. 2015 amendment, after that, judicial authority is deciding only the prima facie validity. So, authority was not deciding validity till 2003. From 3 to 15, authority was deciding validity. From 15 onwards, authority is deciding prima facie validity. So, before authority, judicial authority decides to refer or refuse to refer parties for arbitration, it is now the statutory responsibility of judicial authority to first of all determine prima facie validity of the arbitration agreement. But how determination of validity is different from determination of prima facie validity, that's still not very clear. What is the difference between prima facie validity and determination of validity? This question was answered by the Supreme Court in the case of Shinetsu Chemical Company Limited. Shinetsu Chemical Company Limited versus Messrs. Aksh Optifiber Limited and another 2005. 
this case was decided in the context of section 45. If you remember, I said part 1 relates to domestic arbitration, part 2 relates to enforcement of foreign awards. Foreign awards are awards coming from arbitrations done outside India. If you are doing arbitration in London, an award passed in London will be domestic award for England and will be a foreign award for India. So, if that award has to come to India, it will be enforced under part 2 of that. Section 45 falls in part 2. Now, if there is an arbitration agreement, to do arbitration in England and if any party in relation to that agreement files a case in a court in India, then by virtue of section 45, the courts in India are obliged to refer the matter back to arbitration. So, something which 8 does in domestic context, the same is done by 45 in international context, in foreign award context. Let me tell you one more important point. Till 2015 amendment, as I said, the statement unless it finds that prima facie no valid arbitration agreement exists, this statement was not there in section 8, but this was there since beginning in section 45. So, how I compare the two? There are two differences. I will tell you the first difference between 8 and 45. But first of all, let us understand 8 does something in part 1, the same work is done by 45 in part 2. 8 talks about power of judicial authority to refer the matter for arbitration in India seated arbitration. 45 talks about power of judicial authority to refer the parties for arbitration in foreign seated arbitration. So, that is one difference. 8 is India seated arbitration, 45 is foreign seated arbitration. Otherwise, the job is same. The power is to refer the parties to arbitration. In 8, since beginning, we said judicial authority will not decide validity. In 45, since beginning, we have said that judicial authority will decide prima facie validity before referring or refusing to refer. 8 changed because of Supreme Court order in 2003 and we started determining validity. But 45 remained the same and we continued to determine prima facie validity. So, in order to understand what is prima facie validity, we can use the judgments passed in relation to section 45 because after 2015, this prima facie validity also comes in section 8. I think I have explained it. Now, on this point, both the provisions become same, 8 and 45 become the same because there also judicial authority determines prima facie validity. In 8 also, after 2015 amendment, judicial authority will determine prima facie validity. Now, what does that mean? It has been explained in the case of Shinetsu Chemicals, 2005 Supreme Court and what court said? If the judicial authority is of the opinion that prima facie, a valid arbitration agreement exists, then it shall refer the dispute to arbitration and leave the existence of a valid agreement to be finally determined by the arbitral tribunal. What I read, I said, if judicial authority whether in section 8 with respect to India seated arbitration or in section 45 with respect to foreign seated arbitration. If the judicial authority is of the opinion that a prima facie valid agreement exists, then it is under a duty to refer the dispute for arbitration. And once it refers the dispute to arbitration, it is for the arbitral tribunal to decide the validity finally. So, final determination of validity will be done by the tribunal. Now, if you remember, I said by 2003 decision of Supreme Court, when judicial authority in section 8 started determining validity, the power does not remain with the tribunal and the scope of competence, competence in section 16 reduces. But now that problem has been cured because now judicial authority is only determining prima facie validity on the face of it. If it comes to the conclusion on the face of it that yes, it appears to be valid, send it to tribunal. Tribunal will finally decide whether it is valid or not. So, the power is not curtailed. So, if authority finds that it is prima facie valid, send it to the tribunal for final determination whether the agreement is valid or not. But if the judicial authority 
is of the opinion that no prima facie valid agreement exists. If it decides that prima facie valid agreement exists, it will refer to arbitration and validity will be finally determined by the tribunal. But if the authority comes to opposite decision, it comes to an opinion that agreement is not prima facie valid, then it cannot refer it to tribunal. Then it cannot refer it to tribunal. And tribunal will not come in picture because prima facie agreement does not exist, matter will not go to tribunal. If tribunal does not come into picture, who will finally determine whether the agreement is valid or not? Nobody will finally determine. So therefore, this determination of judicial authority, that prima facie valid agreement does not exist, this determination of judicial authority is considered as final. So judicial authority can take one of these two decisions. It appears to be prima facie valid. Then it will refer it for arbitration. Tribunal will decide finally whether agreement is valid or not. Here the decision is prima facie to be finally determined by the tribunal. But if the judicial authority decides that no prima facie valid agreement exists, it is not a prima facie determination, it is final determination. Right? So therefore, there are two possibilities. The word used in section 8 is judicial authority is obliged to refer the parties for arbitration unless it finds that there is a prima facie valid agreement. If it finds that there exists prima facie valid agreement, it will refer for arbitration, tribunal will come into picture, tribunal will do the final determination. If the authority decides no prima facie agreement exists, that determination becomes final then and there. And if I can refer to section 37 for a moment. Section 37 is an appeal provision. You can go in appeal against the decision of judicial authority. But appeal is not provided against both the decisions. Appeal is provided against only that decision where judicial authority comes to the opinion that there is no prima facie valid agreement. When the proceedings come to an end, when the matter is not referred to tribunal, only that decision is challenged in appeal. Why? Because only final decisions are appealed. An appeal can be filed only against the final determination. Because this determination is only prima facie to be finally determined by the tribunal. So there is no appeal here. And this determination is final determination. It is not to be determined by the tribunal because tribunal will not come into picture. So therefore, there is an appeal against this decision. That is how you have to understand the change which has come in relation to Section 8 of Arbitration Conciliation Act by way of 2015 amendment. Now with this change, what I said, we are in a position to preserve the scope of Section 16. Because in 2003 judgment, we said now if the judicial authority is to decide the validity, then the job is not left for the tribunal to be done. But now judicial authority is only determining prima facie validity. Final determination of validity will be done by the tribunal in section 16. And therefore, scope of section 16 still remains valid. Now, there is another important point. If I go back to my first slide. Notwithstanding any judgment, decree or order of the Supreme Court or any other court. Why have we written this part in section 8.1? Because by way of amendment done in 2015, we wanted to change the law as laid down in Pink City Midway Petroleum case. So whatever any court including Supreme Court may have said, now onwards this is the law. That is what the provision wants to say. I will not repeat it anymore. I have identified the ingredients of section 8. You can see in the case of P. Anand Gajpati Raju versus P. V. G. Raju, P. Anand Gajpati Raju versus P. V. G. Raju, year 2000, 4 SCC. Kindly do not read the red highlighted words. The first point is these are the ingredients of section 8. The first ingredient is there is an arbitration agreement. Second, party to the agreement brings an action before the judicial authority. Third, 
subject matter of the action is the same as the subject matter of the arbitration agreement. The entire subject matter is covered by the arbitration agreement. The entire subject matter of the case which has been filed in the court is covered by the arbitration agreement. And the fourth, the other party moves the judicial authority for referring the parties to arbitration before submitting his first statement on the substance of the dispute. This was the law till it was, till amendment was done in 2015. With the help of certain cases and with the help of some amendment, law has modified and I have inserted these red parts which I will discuss later on. So there is an agreement, party to the agreement goes to court, the subject matter of the case filed in the court is same as the subject matter of agreement, then in that case the other party will oppose, raise the challenge but the condition is he must raise the challenge before submitting on merits. In that case, the judicial authority will refer the parties for arbitration. There are two questions which I will raise here. First is, what if the challenge is raised later than submitting first statement on substance of the dispute? I started contesting the case which you have filed in the court and then I realized, no, no, I should have objected to the jurisdiction of the court. And now I am challenging, no, my Lord, kindly refer the matter back to arbitration. Can I do it? No, I cannot because I have to raise the objection before submitting on merits. Because if I delay it, it is deemed to have been waived by me. I have waived my right to object. Second question is, why are we using the words judicial authority, action, statement? Whereas we could have used the words court, suit, written statement. I have already explained we wanted to create a broad provision which is not limited only to court proceedings. Even tribunals may be included because we have used the word judicial authority. So therefore, we have used the word action. Action will include suits, petitions, applications and statement will include all the possible responses. So therefore, these words have been used to widen the scope of section 8. This was one part of section 8. Whether the judicial authority before referring the parties to arbitration is under a duty to determine validity or not. This was the first aspect. The second aspect is, can a matter be referred to arbitration against non-parties? I'll explain it. There was a case decided in 2003 called as Sukanya Holding Private Limited. Sukanya Holding Private Limited versus Jayesh H. Pandya and another. Sukanya Holding Private Limited versus Jayesh H. Pandya and another. 2003 Supreme Court. In this case, there was a matter some partnership deed, there was a matter related to dissolution of partnership, that partnership document contained an arbitration clause. Now, the dispute arose, instead of referring to arbitration, one party goes to court and claims remedies against the other party to the arbitration agreement, as well as few more people who were not party to arbitration agreement. A case was filed against party to the arbitration agreement as well as against non-parties. When the opposite party approached the court and raised the objection saying that my lord the subject matter is covered in arbitration agreement, kindly refer the matter for arbitration. Then the first party is saying that you see my Claim is not only against you. I am not claiming relief only against you. I am claiming relief under no, against non-parties also. Non, the matter with respect to non-parties cannot be referred for arbitration because they are not party to arbitration agreement. That was the issue here. If my claim is only against the other party to arbitration agreement, it can be referred for arbitration. Can the matter be still be referred to arbitration if the parties in the suit, all of them are not party to agreement? Can the arbitral tribunal decide my matter against those people also who were not party to the arbitration agreement? They were not privy to arbitration clause. Can that be done? Because you see, keep in mind that if requirements of section 8 are proved, 
there is an agreement, matter is covered by agreement, you raise an objection before submitting on merits. If requirements of section 8 are proved, then the court will refer the matter for arbitration. But if the requirements are not proved, then court will continue with the trial. The jurisdiction of court is not ousted. If the requirements are proved, it will go to tribunal. If requirements are not proved, court will continue the trial. Now, in this case, what should do? Should the court split the matter into arbitrable portion, non-arbitrable portion? All the claims which I have raised against the parties to arbitration agreement be separated from all the claims against non-party to arbitration agreement? Should the court split the matter and refer part of it to arbitration and do trial of part of it? Because nowhere in this act you will find something like splitting of the matter into arbitrable, non-arbitrable. Under old 1940 law, Arbitration Act 1940, we had a provision which provided for splitting of matter. Only part of it will be arbitrated, remaining part will go to trial. This was there. But now we don't have it. By the fact that we, de we, we deviated from 1940 Act, it is a deliberate departure. So, legislature probably did not want court to get into this exercise of splitting the cause into two parts. All the claims against parties to agreement will go for arbitration. Rest of the claims will be decided by the court. This is not allowed. Bifurcation of the subject matter of suit was not contemplated. If legislature wanted to allow bifurcation of subject matter, it could have done so by using as many words, by providing for it. So it is not done. Bifurcation is not allowed. Because there will be certain consequences of bifurcation. What shall be the consequences of bifurcation? There may be inevitable delay. Second, it will lead to increase in cost of litigation. There will be two proceedings going on with respect to similar matter, one with tribunal, one with the court. A party is paying money in both the forums. So it may lead to high cost of proceedings. Third, it may lead to harassment of the parties. One party who has filed the suit is compelled to go and defend in arbitration also. I am contesting at two forums that will lead to undue harassment to me. And there is always a possibility of conflicting judgments coming from court and tribunal, arbitral tribunal. So in Sukanya Holding Private Limited versus J.S. H. Pandya and another Supreme Court 2003, court said that if the remedy is claimed against non-parties also, the matter cannot be referred for arbitration. If the remedies are claimed against non-parties also, the matter cannot be referred for arbitration. It was argued that it is so easy to defeat the purpose of Section 8. If I know that if I commit breach of agreement and go to a court, the other party will approach the court and court will send me back to arbitration. If I don't want to go for arbitration, what I will do, I will add one more claim I will add some remedies against some strange people who is not a party to arbitration agreement and then I will file the case and tomorrow when the opposite party comes and contests, raises objection that the matter is covered by agreement, I will say no, I am claiming relief even against non-parties and therefore matter cannot be bifurcated into arbitrable, non-arbitrable parts. Splitting is not contemplated by the legislation. Therefore, the matter cannot be referred for arbitration and I will be successful. So, I can defeat the purpose of Section 8 simply by adding few non-parties as party to the suit. Simply adding few people who are not party to arbitration agreement as party to the suit, I can defeat the purpose of Section 8. This question again comes in 2012 in the case of Chloro Controls Private Limited versus Severn Trent Water Purification Incorporated and others. Chloro Controls Private Limited versus Severn Trent Water Purification Incorporated and others. This is 2012 Supreme Court. This case was decided in the context of Section 45. I should not discuss 45 anymore. You know the difference between 8 and 45. 8 does the thing for part 1. The same thing is done by 45 in relation to foreign thread arbitration, part two arbitrations. 
Now, the question raised there was whether non-signatories to arbitration agreement can be sent for arbitration or not. The similar matter which arose in Sukanya holding. Because the remedy claimed was not only against parties to arbitration agreement, remedies were also claimed against non-parties. So, whether under section 45, but keep in mind there was a difference between 8 and 45 prior to 2015 amendment, I will tell you that difference. And the case was decided, this case was decided by the Supreme Court on the basis of that difference only. Whether in the context of section 48, a matter can be referred for arbitration even against non-signatories to arbitration agreement. Let us see what is there in section 45. A judicial authority when seized of an action in a matter in respect of which the parties have made an arbitration agreement referred to in section 44 shall at the request of one of the parties or any person claiming through or under him refer the parties to arbitration unless it finds prima facie agreement that part we have done unless it prima facie finds that the said agreement is null void inoperative so since beginning judicial authority had this power to decide prima facie validity we have discussed that part now here judicial authority when it gets a matter which is covered by arbitration agreement and the opposite party raises the objection requests the judicial authority then authority will refer the matter for arbitration not only that the request can come from parties or any person claiming through or under him the request to refer the matter for arbitration need not always come from a party to agreement non parties or any person claiming through or under him he is not a person who is a party to agreement he is a person who is claiming through a party to agreement non parties can also request that court must refer the matter for arbitration when non parties can request the matter to be referred to arbitration the converse of it is also true the matter can be referred to arbitration even against non parties also provided non parties are those persons who are claiming through a person who is party to the agreement so now this is the significant difference this phrase was not there in section 8 so non parties do not find place in section 8 when sukanya holding was decided and that is why in sukanya holding court said that there will never be a reference for arbitration if the matter involves people who are not party to arbitration agreement. Whereas in section 45, this part has always been there. And therefore, in the context of 45, the decision of court is different. We will see how court decides it. As I said, in chloro controls also, relief was also claimed against non-parties to arbitration agreement. It was argued that non-parties have been added to defeat the arbitration clause. Non-parties have been added to defeat the purpose of section 45. Supreme Court held that 45 favors reference because unlike 8, it talks about persons claiming through or under somebody who is party to agreement. So it talks about a request coming from non-parties. So it talks about a reference against non-parties which was missing in section 8. Therefore. Sukanya holding, the judgment of Supreme Court in Sukanya holding 2003 cannot be the correct judgment with respect to section 45 because there is difference between section 8 and section 45. So, Supreme Court held that section 45 favors reference more than section 8 because of use of the phrase person claiming through or under any person who is party to the agreement. And court therefore concludes that a reference against non-parties to arbitration agreement is possible in composite transaction cases. Because in chloro controls, what happened was there was a parent agreement, there were six or seven other agreements, few agreements had arbitration clause, few agreements did not have arbitration clause. The dispute arose from one of these contracts. And relief was claimed against people who are party or companies who are parties in other related contracts. Now, all these contracts are interconnected. 
that was the context in which chloro controls case was decided the case was a case of composite transaction where different agreements are interdependent and parties are connected with each other by virtue of various agreements although i may not be a party to an agreement between you and mr a but still i am party to an agreement between parties or in such a way that i am also involved in your contract what i am trying to say is supreme court distinguishes 45 from 8 on the ground that 45 favors reference reference against non parties is possible because non parties have been discussed have been mentioned in section 45 itself so therefore sukanya holding cannot be the correct law with respect to section 45 what do we mean by composite transaction court identifies four five points to understand what are the circumstances in which a matter may be referred for arbitration even against non parties to arbitration agreement first direct relationship to the party signatory to the arbitration agreement i may not be a party to the agreement but i have direct relationship with one of the parties who is signatory to the agreement so i may not be the signatory to agreement but i am directly connected with one of the parties who is signatory to the agreement second is direct commonality of the subject matter direct commonality of the subject matter means first agreement second agreement third fourth fifth all the agreements eventually relate to the same subject matter in one way or the other suppose i am i am outsourcing manufacturing to some company in india i am a foreign company i will uh, uh, there will be a shareholders agreement plus there will be other agreements like licensing agreement i will i will license my trademark i will transfer my know how all these agreements are different agreements but all these are connected to a common subject matter so if there is commonality of subject matter that case can be a case of composite transaction composite transaction means where performance of the agreement the performance of mother agreement the main agreement depends on performance of other agreements you cannot perform the main agreement without performing other related agreements in such situation you can say it is a case of composite transaction in such composite transaction cases reference against non parties is also possible and the last point which court mentions is whether a composite reference of such parties would serve the ends of justice if referring the matter to arbitration serves the ends of justice refer it even against non parties so now if i put things together what i see sukanya holding was was decided in 2003 and in sukanya holding it was held that there cannot be any reference against non parties and we thought that this is the law for both section 8 as well as section 45 despite the difference in terms of language used we thought sukanya holding is the correct law both for section 8 and section 45 and it continued to be like that till 2012 in 2012 supreme court decides chloro controls and holds that section 45 is different from section 8 because the language used in section 45 also refers to any person claiming through or under a person who is party to the agreement so once we understood that 8 is different 45 is different in terms of language in terms of scope in terms of possibility of reference to arbitration because in chloro control supreme court observed that 45 favors reference more than section 8 so once we understood that section 45 is different from section 8 after the judgment of chloro controls it was clarified that sukanya holding is the correct law with respect to section 8 and chloro controls is the correct law with respect to section 45 that means with respect to section 8 in the matters of section 8 splitting not possible reference against non party is not possible in relation to section 45 reference against non parties is very much possible that was the distinction which was maintained and then in 2015 we amended the provision 
And by amending the provision, if I can take you the first to the first slide, section 8 says, if, if I read it again, a judicial authority before which an action is brought in a matter which is the subject of an arbitration agreement shall, if a party to the agreement or any person claiming through or under him. Now you see this part which was not there till 2015. This is the reason for distinction between Sukanya holding and chloro controls. When this part comes in section 8 also, the distinction goes and therefore there is no reason for having different law, one for section 8 and one for section 45. Now let's go back to the last slide once again. So what I have written is Sukanya holding was the law till 2012 for section 8 as well as section 45. Post 2012, Sukanya holding was the law for section 8 and chloro controls was the law for section 45. But after 2015, when the difference between section 8 and section 45 did not remain relevant, then after 2015, chloro controls becomes the law both for section 8 and section 45. Now today, if a matter is, is filed before the court and remedies are claimed even against non-parties, in both the cases, whether it is section 8 or 45, court will refer the parties for arbitration provided it is a case of composite transaction which was held in the case of Sukanya holding. I will go back once again to this slide where I have written certain part in red. All this now is easy to understand. There was at one point of time in 1996 the law with following ingredients which we read. Now we will read it along with the red part. This is how the law has changed. The first point there is an arbitration agreement that is no more true. The correct statement is there is a prima facie valid arbitration agreement. Second, party to the agreement brings an action before the judicial authority. No, that is not true anymore. Party to the agreement or anybody or any person claiming through or under him. So a non-party can also do it. Point number three, Subject matter of the action is same as the subject matter of arbitration agreement. If you recall what we discussed in Sukanya holding, court said splitting is not contemplated. So entire subject matter must be covered by arbitration agreement. So it is not subject matter of the action. It is entire subject matter of the action which should be covered in the arbitration agreement. And the fourth point, the other party moves the judicial authority for referring the parties to arbitration. Now it has changed. The other party moves the judicial authority for referring the parties or anybody claiming through or under him in a case of composite transaction to arbitration before submitting his first statement on the substance of the dispute. I am sure if you go back to the contents once again, you will be in a position to understand the changes in a better way. So kindly refer to the ingredients of section 8 as laid down in PVG Raju case which I just presented which is highlighted in red. That journey from black to the portions highlighted in red has been the journey of section 8 from 1996 to 2015 or till present time. So that's all about section 8 which I wanted to discuss. Thank you very much for attending the session.